Welcome back from the break, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Max Hillebrand. He uh, is a free software entrepreneur. And Max is contributing to several free software projects, building the tools we want to use in order to defend uh, his liberties. Uh, as these weapons of cyberspace are fundamentally non-scarce, he shares his work free for anyone to use. His focus is on creating a second realm with a sound monetary economy in which sovereign individuals can pursue their entrepreneurial action. Thank you so much for joining us, Max. Thank you, much. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for the introduction and for the invitation here to speak at the MIT Bitcoin Expo. Um, yes, uh, so uh, today I would really much uh, like to talk about uh, some fundamental praxeological reasoning uh, in the Austrian tradition, uh, specifically in the terms of capital allocation, uh, which is, of course, fundamental uh, to consider in any economy. Uh, and here, uh, as in or in the praxeological tradition, as always, we start out with axioms, uh, with first principles uh, and assumptions uh, that we just hold to be self-evident. Uh, and for me, the uh, first one to consider is that I, the individual, exist. Right? Uh, individuals, in fact, uh, are alive uh, and manifest themselves in reality. Uh, and you know, they have all types of problems. Uh, they live in a state of uneasiness uh, with uh, you know, an, an unoptimal solution, uh, a point of suffering, uh, basically. Uh, and the genius entrepreneurial insight uh, and is that creativity uh, to think of a potential future where these problems are solved, uh, where the individual no longer is at that point of suffering, uh, but where he has figured out uh, all the solutions to his problems. Uh, and not just does the entrepreneur have this creative mind uh, to see that better future, he actually has the will uh, and the power to manifest that future into existence. Uh, and here is where time uh, comes into the picture. Uh, we have a point before the action and a point after the action. Right? And uh, that temporal difference is specifically defined by the individual acting, by manifesting change and by solving his problems outright. Uh, this uh, change also involves choices right? because uh, there are multiple independent visions of a better future that the entrepreneur can think up for himself. Uh, and he will have to weigh which of these potential opportunities he prefers most. And this is a subjective valuation at its core, meaning that only the individual himself actually knows all of these potential outcomes that he sees, and he can compare them to his current problems uh, that he tries to solve, uh, ultimately finding out which problem is the most dire one and how to get the most efficient uh, and capital intent or uh, a capital efficient uh, way to solve this problem. Um, and here again, this opportunity cost uh, is fundamental, meaning with, with any choice uh, that we make, with any potential action that is being done, we forego billions of other opportunities with which we could have spent our time. Uh, and this again goes down to the fundamental capital uh, of every individual, his time and attention, where he will focus his mental power and manifest the change in reality itself. Um, so with this in mind, how does this tie in now expanding from just the isolated individual um, to, for example, a, a system with two individuals, uh, the lonely island of Robinson and Crusoe? Uh, here, uh, we see that there are two individuals now that have both their own unique problems that only they know about, uh, and they do see potential futures uh, uh, to solve these problems. But interestingly, is that uh, they can now collaborate, uh, meaning to divide their labor and to focus uh, on solving one problem where they are marginally superior at. Uh, so whichever problem that they can solve most efficiently. Uh, and as every, uh, each one of these individuals focuses uh, on their individual tasks, uh, this means that they can share or their outcome is going to be more plentiful uh, because they both could work on the thing they were more efficiently at. And now as they engage in trade, voluntary interaction, where uh, Robinson gives his uh, you know, apple that he picked in the forest to Crusoe in exchange uh, for uh, you know, a log of wood 
uh, the Crusoe uh, found in the forest as well. Right? Uh, now both individuals can uh, come together and trade uh, their fruits, the fruits of their labor in order to improve their own situation. Right? The, the one person values the good that the other person has more uh, than his own good and therefore is willing to give it up in exchange, to sacrifice the scarce good that he has worked on so, uh, so much. Uh, so, so this exchange uh, is fundamentally a solution to the conflict over who can own and utilize uh, scarce resources given in the economy. Uh, and again, scarce resources can be time, uh, but of course, material goods and even goods in cyberspace, as Bitcoin teaches us, uh, that uh, uh, where there is this potential conflict of ownership and property rights and uh, the proliferation of property rights uh, in exchange uh, is fundamental in allocating these resources efficiently. Uh, and this, of course, scales into much deeper production cycles, uh, where we have many more market participants than just two individuals, Robinson and Crusoe, uh, but an entire plethora of individuals coming together. Um, here, again, each individual in that large market economy uh, is the best to identify his own problems uh, and to think for his own solutions. Uh, and uh, but on a much larger scale, uh, because we have more individuals available to focus uh, on their areas of expertise, uh, we can generate more capital uh, that will help us to solve uh, more problems. Um, and ultimately, you know, uh, as uh, this large market evolves, uh, the uh, um, the cost of having a barter system, as we all know, uh, will be too much uh, to handle a, a market at scale. Uh, therefore, uh, that natural tendency towards using a money, uh, which is defined as the most liquid medium of exchange uh, that emerges out of this barter uh, economy. Uh, and now the question is of how can we get these uh, or, or what are the attributes of a monetary system and how do they um, encourage entrepreneurs in their quest for solving problems uh, or uh, discourage them? Um, and Bitcoin comes to a very interesting conclusion uh, that stands quite in contrast to the previous fiat regime, uh, where the money supply uh, is clearly defined um, in the Bitcoin consensus rules. Um, with 50 Bitcoin per block, uh, with 10 blocks every 10 minutes, and with a halvening of this block reward uh, every 210,000 blocks. Uh, obviously defined in just a couple lines of code, uh, with a very or and this is, just to be frank, this is still an increase in the money supply. Uh, even though we know that there are at most 21 million Bitcoin, um, still the actually liquid available supply of Bitcoin does increase with every block as miners get to spend it. Um, therefore, uh, even the, the effects of the Cantillon um, uh, or the Cantillon effects are still in place as those who receive newly printed money first gain in proportion uh, to those who have held on to the money uh, and will receive it at a later po uh, point in time. Uh, so those who do um, uh, bi mine Bitcoin, uh, the miners who uh, find valid blocks and therefore get 50 new Bitcoin uh, in subsidy, um, those are the first beneficiary of the Cantillon effect. Um, with, a one, with one very, very important differentiation to how this is happening in the fiat regime is that, of course, these rules are obvious uh, and, and publicly declared and agreed upon by everyone who runs a full note. Uh, just by the fact of uh, running the software, uh, it is an implicit agreement uh, to following these rules, at least uh, on your own full note. Uh, so this is not theft, uh, as is the inflation in the fiat regime. Uh, and thus, I, I would not like to call the issuance rate of Bitcoin an inflation, but rather the issuance rate, uh, as inflation for me entails that ethical aspect of theft. Um, Though nevertheless, the Cantillon effect is still present, uh, meaning that uh, th those who receive the newly mon uh, printed money first will invest it in production stages that are marginally less superior than, uh, uh, than with what they have invested in with their previous money. Um, so here again, the entrepreneurs will, if they receive this money for gratis, um, 
invested into less suitable uh, um, goods and services, and especially those with a longer production uh, horizon. Uh, so more deeper production stages, which require more liquidity, uh, which is only satisfied uh, by, of course, uh, receiving the newly created Bitcoin. Um, and I think we have seen this type of malinvestment play out in the Bitcoin uh, economy in the early stages uh, with that rapid boom uh, in the, the mining economy and infrastructure, where, for example, ASIC chips were developed at, at rapid rate uh, and, and uh, very, uh, well, exponential, uh, clearly a, a, a quite a... Uh, boom period, so to say, and potentially also we saw a bust uh, with companies uh, like BitMEX, uh, um, uh, sorry, um, the ASIC producer going, uh, yeah, uh, many ASIC producers going bust after all. Um, so, but nevertheless, uh, there, um, there's, even though we still had this early Cantillon effect, uh, by now the Bitcoin issuance rate is uh, quite small. Um, the, uh, meaning the stock to flow is relatively high. We are uh, creating less new fresh Bitcoin now than we did previously. Um, so I would argue that the Cantillon effect is about to subside uh, and no longer be as prevalent in, and hopefully lead to less of a boom and bust cycle structure in Bitcoin. Um, but still, uh, even now in that stage where the Bitcoin money supply is rather stable, uh, the uh, capital allocation for entrepreneurs is still very interesting. Uh, specifically, uh, because finally, uh, we have a, a provable analysis of the base monetary supply, meaning every entrepreneur can now uh, price his holdings uh, and, of course, the prices he charges for his goods in a percentage of the money supply. Uh, so if I charge one Bitcoin uh, for my services, this is one out of 21 million Bitcoin, a clear percentage uh, of the total purchasing power uh, that this uh, monetary economy holds. Uh, and, as, uh, and this, again, is incredibly interesting for both measuring your investment costs. So how much percentage of the money supply did you invest in your lower order production stages goods? Uh, so to build up uh, that capital infrastructure, um, and uh, uh, how much more, uh, or uh, sorry, and uh, and how much are you then later earning uh, by providing your good and service uh, for consumers at the market? Um, and this discrepancy is profit um, measured as a percentage of money supply, uh, which is incredibly fascinating. Um, and this arguably provides much more stability for entrepreneurial cal uh, capital allocation calculations, uh, as that percentage of money supply was never known before. Uh, but with a caveat that, of course, the value of this monetary asset is not just the supply, which is now defined, but also the demand uh, for, the, uh, for this unit uh, of monetary asset. Um, and this is where the volatility is of obviously still here, uh, because, again, individuals' values are subjective and only they know about them and they change uh, all the time, uh, even from one person to the other. And, of course, from the same person uh, to himself in a later point in time. Um, so the demand for Bitcoin will always be volatile, uh, as is the demand for any good. Um, with the special volatility of a new monetary asset being born uh, after a 100-year uh, fiat regime uh, of inflationary policies. Um, and the interesting aspect here is that uh, Bitcoin comes in at a time where fiat shitcoins are hyperinflating to an unheard of level. Um, and this is especially seen in the price of Bitcoin or in, in the price of the US dollar denominated in Bitcoin. Uh, which as a sound monetary economist, uh, you will have to denominate your, your prices and your mindset in Bitcoin. Um, uh, how many dollars can you get for one Bitcoin? Um, uh, and um, so um, with... So, so to elaborate that further, we, uh, we now have the ability to, to measure our wealth in percentage of the money supply, but still the demand is subject to change, especially because it is this uh, hyperinflating uh, fiat economy, as well as a novel Bitcoin economy that is being grown out, uh, out of nothing. Uh, therefore, the demand of Bitcoin is steadily increasing at a rapid rate, uh, and the, the value of the monetary unit increases. And here is one interesting aspect that um, the uh, capitalists always carry the risk of time, meaning that they have to invest their uh, capital goods today 
in these long production stages to at a later uncertain point in the future uh, be able to have that final consumption good ready for sale uh, to the end consumer. Um, and of course, the investments are done at a rate where Bitcoin was still cheap, right? Uh, where you had to invest many Bitcoin uh, for land and labor and capital. Um, while at the outcomes, four, five, ten years later, uh, after the entire production stage is complete, um, the uh, one Bitcoin will be worth uh, much, much more, uh, and the customers will only be willing to sacrifice a couple thousand of Satoshis uh, for their good or service. Uh, so here, presumably, it is extremely um, uh, discouraged for entrepreneurs to take on a long uh, investment uh, horizon and uh, to, uh, to build for these longer, more uh, profitable uh, or more prolific, uh, deeper production stages. Um, and I think this is definitely something that we see with an extreme tendency of Bitcoin users to focus on saving, right? And savings is the exact opposite of investing, right? Saving is exactly to say that I forgo any of today's consumption or investment where I will not spend my money on either of those. I will simply save my money and hobble my precious Satoshis. Um, so this uh, ag ag aggressive savings rate uh, is really what uh, defines the Bitcoiners' mindset in, ex in, in an extent. Um, and it, it shows that in the previous fiat regime, there was a massive malinvestment and overconsumption happening uh, to, an extent that is, as, uh, to an extent that is simply no longer um, uh, reasonable and, uh, and approachable. And now Bitcoin comes in as this sound monetary asset, uh, as this counter force uh, that actually protects savings of individuals and therefore is a suitable option for, in, for individuals to finally save their capital uh, and not uh, having the need to invest it and or to consume it. Um, uh, and th this will again change the capital structure quite drastically, meaning that in the short term, uh, there will be far, far fewer projects uh, being built with a longer production horizon, simply because they are no longer affordable, uh, as the price of Bitcoin will be rocketing in the next couple of years. Um, though the though this means that individuals accumulate capital in savings which as we just laid out earlier will potentially increase uh, in value in the future uh, so these individuals who forgo the investment in deep production stages today will have more capital to invest in exactly these production stages or advanced ones if they have figured out some some new ways and technologies uh, but this investment will come at a later point in time where it is actually efficient to do um, I think Bitcoin shows us fundamentally just how incredibly inefficient uh, the fiat regime was in the last 100 years uh, and how deeply uh, obstructed and, and manipulated uh, price levels and interest rates uh, have been. And Bitcoin is, uh, at this current point in time, uh, already a massive counter movement against uh, this fiat regime in the sense of helping entrepreneurs to, to understand the, the mistakes that happened in the past uh, and to depreciate and to kill the companies uh, that uh, that are so inefficient, right? Uh, to to let them go bankrupt and to take the capital that was in these illiquid, improductive companies and shift it into shorter production stages, uh, which are more needed at this current point in time. Um, I mean, the food shortages are probably around the corner. Uh, so uh, this reallocation of capital from longer production stages to shorter production stages, or even to the shortest production stage, which is no production stage at all, just to hold your Bitcoin and not invest it at all. Uh, it, this is what exactly what we need now to clean up the gigantic mess that was created uh, by monetary economics uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and it is, it is really a blessing that we have Bitcoin at this point in time. Uh, it really comes in quite handy. Uh, and I uh, would have much less hope in the future of humanity uh, at this point in time of the fiat uh, cycle uh, without having such a tool as Bitcoin. Um, and it is, it is an extreme harsh tool for entrepreneurs. Because as we said, it is extremely difficult to be profitable in a Bitcoin denominated market uh, as the Bitcoin purchasing power just rapidly increases. Um, but this does not mean that entrepreneurial action is, is uh, 
not needed or not worthy. Uh, quite on the contrary, especially in these times, we do need entrepreneurs uh, who, first of all, have saved in the past, right, and who can now marginally invest a small percentage of their savings, right, and not much, but a small percentage uh, into actually building these infrastructures. And here is where I particularly love the ethos of free software that is so prevalent uh, in the development of, of many companies in the space, and that is to scratch your own itch, right? Instead of uh, trying to seek that value out on uh, external customers, where we demand on their later purchasing power in Bitcoin, um, rather uh, trying to solve the problems that actually occur to me, myself, uh, and my company, um, and uh, therefore build and invest in these, infra in, in these infrastructure projects simply out of selfish own need uh, for needing that tool to, to solve a certain project, a problem, uh, but with the long-term benefit that this investment will actually be much more productive uh, for those deeper uh, production stages uh, that we can now gradually build up again in a sound monetary Bitcoin economy uh, with much less of the malinvestment and overconsumption uh, that we had in the fiat regime. Again, I, I do believe that th those uh, malinvestments and overconsumptions did occur in the early Bitcoin high issuance rate times, but nowadays, hopefully the Cantillon effect is subsiding uh, quite drastically. Um, now, I, I would love to get some of your questions here on record as well. Uh, so if we have some, I would be delighted, uh, I would be delighted uh, to take them, yes. Okay, so we have a question for you right now. Um, so uh, what happens to, su to the supply of uh, Bitcoin as user numbers increase, keys are lost, and Bitcoin dust gets left all over the place? Do we end up with negative inflation? Does the 21 million BTC be become, say, 15 million usable Bitcoin in 1,000 years? And does this matter? This is a really, really good question. And yes, it does matter. The total money supply does matter. Uh, and the beauty of Bitcoin is that for the first time, we can actually verify it, right? And uh, one important thing, um, the rules that we define on our full node say that a block can, uh, the Coinbase transaction of a block can at most contain 50 Bitcoin, right? So already miners can choose to uh, pay themselves less Bitcoin, uh, like just you know, 49 Bitcoin or even zero Bitcoin. Totally possible and it has happened on multiple occasions. Um, coins can become unspent. Uh, when they include the op return output. Uh, and um, here, even Satoshis can be inside these coins. Uh, and of course, private keys can be forgotten um, uh, or become inaccessible or even you know, a mistake in writing the Bitcoin script that just is unable to be uh, validated. Uh, yes, all of these aspects decrease the money supply the same as, for example, uh, if you if you take your gold coins on a ship and the boat sinks, right, uh, and it is at the bo uh, bottom of the ocean, it's pretty much unspendable, right? Uh, same concept. So yes, this is a decrease in the monetary um, uh, supply, and therefore this is a deflationary event. Um, now, again, it is a voluntary basis, right? This is not someone censoring certain coins from becoming unspendable. Um, and therefore, it is, again, ethically viable. But yes, it does, again, increase a negative Cantillon effect so that those who hold the money increase uh, their purchasing power, while those who lost the money, of course, lose their purchasing power, their percentage allocation of the money supply. Um, and yes, this is important for entrepreneurs to, to think about. Right? Um, again, it, I, I love that Bitcoin has the 21 million supply limit, but I will maybe never live to that supply limit, right? Uh, I uh, like right now we are at what 18.5 million Bitcoin uh, or something, right? So this is today's Bitcoin money supply. So it is increasing steadily, but it is also decreasing steadily by becoming completely unspendable. And further, the duration of how long an individual holds his monetary asset uh, is, of course, a, a, a result of time preference. Uh, meaning if you are a high time preference user, if you're willing to forgo your consumption or investment today for a later future, um, then th this means you can hold your wealth longer and you will be less likely to spend it uh, today. Um, while, of course, eventually you will have to eat, your time preference is always positive. It cannot be zero or negative. Um, and uh, therefore, you will eventually spend the Bitcoin, this adding your Bitcoin to the actual uh, supply of money uh, on the liquid market itself. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And we have one more question for you. What has to happen to keep the returns in Bitcoin scaling? What is the biggest threat? Yes. Um, 
what has to be scaled is the verification of the global consensus state, uh, the Bitcoin blockchain itself. Uh, this needs to be scaled even at a high transaction throughput. And that is the most difficult part. It's easy to make many transactions. It's difficult to verify them. Uh, so optimizing the Bitcoin core full node client and potentially even other clients to do this verification work more efficient is incredibly, incredibly val valuable and has been done in the past by, by to a great extent. Uh, but also the, the art or science of uh, making uh, economic transactions in a Bitcoin uh, economy without relying on the verification of everyone. Um, so uh, this, this is, for example, the concept of Lightning Network or more general client-side uh, validated state, um, where the, the actual verification cost um, relies on the sender and receiver of a transaction, um, but not on the global consensus layer, while only um, dispute resolutions have to be settled on the Bitcoin blockchain itself. Um, which is, I think, a much more efficient way uh, to, again, scale that global consensus that needs to be scaled, um, but uh, which, of course, is, is very difficult to do. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time and for answering these questions, Max. And... Organizing the event. I hope to see you next year, too. Definitely. Thank you so much.